Good afternoon and welcome to today's meeting on Iran, Iraq, and the United States, the view from Tehran. Uh, we are very fortunate to have with us today uh, Selig Harrison, who has visited Iran twice in the last uh, nine months and uh, had a chance to speak to a number of Iranian officials. Um, uh, Selig is a senior public policy scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholar, and he's the director of the Asia program of the Center for International Policy. He's a former director of Asian Studies at Brookings Institution. He's the author of a number of books, including In Afghanistan's Shadow, uh, India, The Most Dangerous Decades, and Korean Endgame, A Strategy for Reunification, and U.S. Disengagement. Uh, the last two books were published by Princeton University Press. Uh, Mr. Harrison is going to speak for 35 minutes, and then we will open the floor to questions and you um, would answer them, please. Well, Holly, thank you very much. I, I want to say at the outset that my two trips to Iran have had a limited objective, to explore the terms for a modus vivendi in Iraq, Afghanistan, and the Gulf. I've been there six times before, but that was before the revolution, and I am not a Farsi speaker. So I'm very much aware that I'm not competent to make judgments about the internal situation, and I will not do so. I'm sure there are many of you here who are much more competent to do so. So far, I haven't been able, on my two visits, uh, to see Ahmadinejad uh, for a one-on-one, -on -one, although I was present at a meeting in New York where Barber was present and others when he came to New York, uh, I haven't been able to see Khamenei or their closest advisors. But I have had good conversations with key people who advise the National Security Council in the next to the very top level. The Foreign Ministry arranged a three-hour seminar on my last visit in February with 15 Iraq specialists from different agencies at my request. And of course, I have met a broad spectrum of editors, scholars, and diplomats who welcomed the opportunity to talk with Americans. In Washington, of course, the focus of most discussions on Iran is the nuclear issue. But in Tehran, what I found they wanted to talk about right now is Iraq. One comment on Iraq makes a good starting point today. I talked with Mahmoud Vezi, a former deputy foreign minister who now heads Rafsanjani's think tank, the Center for Strategic Research. He said, quote, you know, we have been waiting for this moment since 1639, <laughs> unquote. 1639 is the year, as I'm sure most of you know, the year of the, the Treaty of Kasser i Shireen. Uh, that was the treaty that defined the boundary between Safavid Persia and the advancing Ottoman Turks, who pushed Persia out of what was to become the modern state of Iraq. Before 1639, Persia had extensive influence in Mesopotamia through local Shiite principalities. The Shia religious universe embraced parts of both Persia and Mesopotamia, and Shia clerics commuted back and forth between religious centers on both sides as they do today. After 1639, the Turks and then the British installed Sunni regimes in Iraq. Then came Saddam's Sunni dictatorship and his invasion of Iran in 1980 with U.S. help and encouragement. What Vesey meant was that for five centuries, Iran has been hoping the day would come when Sunni minority rule would end in Baghdad and Tehran would get back some of its old influence. So when George W. Bush destroyed the Saddam regime in the name of democracy, Iran's reaction was ambivalent. 
It didn't like the idea of a U.S. occupation force and U.S. bases on its borders. But it did hope that the Shiite majority of 62 percent would come into its own and that Iraq would tilt toward Iran after the American occupation ended. Some of you may have wondered, as I've wondered, whether President Bush and his advisors recognized that destroying a dictatorship controlled by the Sunni minority would lead to the domination of a democratic Iraq by its Shiite majority, thus giving Shiite Iran unprecedented influence in Baghdad. The president, for his part, clearly did not have Iran and the Shiite connection on his mind. On January 10, 2003, just two months before the invasion, author Kanan Makia and two other Iraqi exiles opposed to Saddam met with Bush to discuss scenarios for a post-invasion Iraq. They were astonished to find that he had never heard of the Sunni-Shia divide in Islam and spent most of their meeting giving him a history lesson. Bush's Pentagon advisors were better informed, but they too were not worried about empowering Iran. I had a talk a couple of weeks ago about this with Douglas Fife, Donald Rumsfeld's Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. Fife said he believed in 2003 that invading Iraq might speed up the collapse of the Islamic Republic. Here's what he said, quote, we were conscious of the fact that Shiite political power in Iraq would help Iran, but it was unclear to us how it would all net out, <clears throat> and it's still unclear. After all, he said, Ayatollah Sistani believes in the separation of church and state. The Ayatollahs in Tehran believe they have a divine right to rule. So Sistani is enormously threatening to them. The net result of the invasion could well be the unraveling of the regime in Tehran, with Iranians inspired by the example of the Iraqi Revolution, unquote. All those words are Doug Fights. So Fife still calls what's happening in Iraq the Iraqi Revolution. In his new memoir, War and Decision, he argues that both North Korea and Iran were on the verge of collapse in 2003, so it wasn't necessary to take preemptive action. In contrast to Iraq, where they thought there was no prospect of getting rid of Saddam without an invasion. Paul Wolfowitz, Rumsfeld's number two, hasn't written his memoirs yet, but his argument in the internal debates, I'm told, was different and more realistic. Wolfowitz emphasized that the Iraqi Shiites are Arabs who don't like being patronized uh, by uh, uh, Persians. So he argued that a Shiite-dominated Iraq would never be a puppet of Iran. He was right about that, in my view. But what about an Iraq that is closer to Iran than to any other external power? which is where the situation, in my view, is moving. Wolfowitz did recognize that the U.S. had to have a Shiite frontman, and that was one of the reasons he pushed Ahmed Shalabi. The U.S. was slow to, rec to learn that the Shiite politicians who count in Baghdad are Abdelaziz al-Hakim, who had strong military ties with Iran, of course, dating back to the Iran-Iraq War, and Muqtada al-Sadr, who emerged on the scene more recently and also has close ties to Tehran. The center of al sadrs support is the urban underclass and Hakim is close to the mercantile interests. It's significant, I think, that Iran has carefully avoided playing favorites between the two, unlike the United States, which is now positioned against al sadr This is dangerous militarily because uh, Sadr's Baghdad following of more than two million is concentrated in the slum areas uh, known, of course, as Sadr City that are located within missile range of the Green Zone. This would make it very risky for the administration to carry out its threats to retaliate for Iranian aid to Shiite militias, 
or to bomb Iran's nuclear facilities. Sadr's forces have already fired small rockets into the Green Zone, and if they fired bigger ones, the U.S. military position in Iraq would become increasingly untenable. That's why the U.S. forces are trying to build a wall that pushes Sadr's missile emplacements back as far as possible from the Green Zone. And that's why we just learned yesterday, I think it was, the day before, that Apache helicopters are attacking Sadr's forces, which has led to missile attacks by the Mahdi army on the helicopters in a significant escalation of hostilities. I don't want to suggest that I was given explicit threats, heard explicit threats when I was in Tehran about the uh, use of Sadr City militarily, but lots of things came through in innuendos. The U.S. decision to step up military action against the Mahdi army was a major departure in U.S. policy in recent weeks and might have been one of the factors contributing to the timing of the Hezbollah offensive in Lebanon. Some of you may have explanations for that timing in local factors in Lebanon. I would like to hear them in our discussion, but if there are not explanations for the timing in the local environment or other explanations that those of you who specialize in Lebanon put forward in our discussion, it seems to me that Iranian anger, which I heard over the U.S. role in Sadr City, might well help to explain this tragic development in Lebanon. I heard plenty of that anger in Tehran, even before the recent escalation in Sadr City had gotten, really gotten underway, and two weeks ago, uh, the Iranian ambassador in Baghdad, Hassan Koumi, made the first formal statement he ever made to the press there pleading for the U.S. to back off. Here's what he said, quote, The American insistence on coming and having a siege on a couple of million people in one area and striking them with, with warplanes and shelling them randomly, many innocent people will be killed through this operation. So when the change in U.S. military strategy toward uh, Muqtada started, Iran did react very, uh, very explicitly, and I had heard many things that prepared me for that. Now, all of you know that the magnitude of Iran's influence in Iraq, I think it's important to underscore it, was dramatically demonstrated by Ahmadinejad's triumphal February visit to Baghdad, by the continuing Iranian role in keeping the peace between the warring Shiite factions. It's now clearly established to my satisfaction that the March truce after the fighting in Basra was definitely brokered by a Revolutionary Guard general, the multiplicity of sources on this, and that the truce negotiations were held in Qom. The truce last week between the Sadr and Hakim militias was negotiated in Tehran. So we have to give serious attention to Iran's view of what should come next in Iraq, and I'm now going to focus on that in specific terms. I was told repeatedly that Iran has been restraining Sadr so far with an implicit threat that this wouldn't go on indefinitely if we didn't shape up. That Iran has been restraining Sadr so far and is ready to cooperate in stabilizing Iraq. I had heard this a great deal in my visit last June and I heard it uh, much more insistently on this last visit in February. But only, they say, if Washington sets a timetable for the gradual withdrawal of U.S. combat forces. Uh, they're not, uh, I found no one in Tehran who thinks would be pleased to see the U.S. move too quickly. But I also found no one who doesn't think that something within two years or uh, some, some such time would be appropriate. And, and uh, secondly, uh, for sta in return for stabilizing Iraq, the basic uh, U.S. Uh, quid pro quo would be accepting Iran's right to be a major player in post-war Baghdad, along with the United States and eventually Saudi Arabia. The acceptance of the United States as a con having a continued role in Iraq is 
clear, explicit, the acceptance of Saudi Arabia, somewhat less explicit, but implicit in lots of things. Now, I mentioned the foreign ministry seminar, uh, and one of the Iranians there exclaimed, quote, how can you accuse us of interfering in Iraq? You've come from 6,000 miles away with 160,000 soldiers. We are an immediate neighbor with a 1,000-mile border and intimate historical, religious, economic ties going back for centuries. You helped Saddam against us in a war that cost us more than 300,000 lives. So naturally, we want to be sure that Iraq is in friendly hands. Now, that theme I heard many times. Uh, the importance of the Iran-Iraq war, which is not on America's radar screen very much, cannot be overemphasized, in my view, uh, in, in, as uh, the background of, um, as the basic context of the present situation in Iraq and, of course, the present situation with respect to the nuclear issue. Now, by a friendly Iraq, Iraq means one dominated by the Shiite majority. As I've said, Tehran has carefully avoided taking sides in the internal Shiite power struggle now going on and wants the United States to do the same. In the bargain envisaged by the Iranian officials I met, Washington would end its current military offensive against Muqtada al sadr Iran would pledge not to give him missiles capable of hitting the green zone. It would end aid to all non-government militias in Iraq when U.S. combat forces are withdrawn. Now, there's a great deal of ambiguity about this on this point as to when such a commitment would become operative, but I think the safest way to predict what would come out in negotiations is when the withdrawal com is completed. It would help with intelligence. Iran would help with intelligence in eliminating al-Qaeda in Iraq. It would contribute to economic reconstruction and would coordinate this contribution with what the U.S. and multilateral agencies do. Now, two Iranian demands that I heard often would be particularly difficult to get through the U.S. policy process. All of this would be, but of course, but, but uh, two in particular I want to mention. One is that Iran wants the U.S. to end its use of the Mujahideen Kalk as an arm of U.S. intelligence in Iran. It wants the U.S. to put the 3,700 MEK fighters now at Camp Ashraf in Iraq through a Red Cross screening process so that those ready to do so can leave MEK and return to Iran. Another demand of particular importance to Iran is that the U.S. should stop building up Sunni militias under U.S. control that now number more than 91,000 fighters, each paid $300 a month. The Iranian perception is that the U.S. wanted provincial elections moved up in the hope of increasing Sunni strength in the provincial councils. They blame this for stepping up the power struggle among the Shiite factions. Now, it would not be easy to roll back the Sunni awakening and to take 91,000 men off the U.S. payroll. Stephen Simon points out in an excellent foreign affairs article that $150 million has been budgeted for the program this year. And the Sunni tribal sheikhs, quote, take as much as 20% of every payment to a former insurgent, which means that commanding 200 fighters, if you're a Sunni sheikh, can be worth well over $100,000 a year, unquote. So we started something that will be difficult to stop, but from Iran's point of view, which is what I'm trying to describe today, ending the Sunni awakening must go with cooperation in stabilizing Iraq. In Iranian eyes, it is part of a divide and rule U.S. strategy designed to offset Shiite power in Iraq and make it a U.S. protectorate with an indefinite U.S. combat force uh, presence and permanent U.S. bases. This is the, the Sunni awakening policy is seen as connected with, as, as indicative of our long-range goals in Iraq. So it's really quite a pivotal uh, 
pivotal point. And when we uh, embarked on this policy, George Packer pointed out in an excellent New Yorker article that this was where we were, we were going. The Iranian attitude on the future of U.S. bases, I might interject here, is not yet well defined. But my impression is they do not expect the U.S. to shut down all of them and will focus on security guarantees ruling out the use of Iraq for attacks against Iran. Again, this is not some, this particular point is one of those where there's more that was implicit than what was explicit, and this, of course, would be one of the big bargaining issues in anything that, uh, any bargaining that might take place uh, in the future. Now, what would happen to the Sunnis, I'm often asked, if the U.S. withdraws and if Iraq tilts to Tehran? In my view, they would have to accept rule by the Shiite majority. Just as Shiites have accepted Sunni domination for the past five centuries under the Sunni regimes installed by the Turks, by the British, by Saddam. I said something that, that got some action here. George Bush consigned the Sunnis to this status when he overthrew Saddam. But the United States does have a moral obligation to join with Saudi Arabia and others to prevent any persecution. For this reason, a U.S.-Iran bargain should, in my view, be accompanied by broader regional arrangements in which Riyadh and others join with Tehran and Washington in stabilizing Iraq. Iran is ready for a regional approach. The American media has given little attention to the Iranian proposal made in Istanbul last November by Mr. Motaki and brushed off rather unceremoniously by Mr. Satterfield for a regional peacekeeping force. It ignored Ahmadinejad's summit meeting with Saudi King Abdullah in March 2007 and his conciliatory overtures at the December Doha summit of the GCC. Now, the United States and Iran, it seems to me, have a basic common interest in maintaining some form of unified Iraqi state. Tehran does not want a breakup along ethnic lines that would strengthen the movement for an independent Kurdistan because this would embrace its own restive Kurdish areas. So in return for facilitating a graceful gradual U.S. withdrawal, Iran would expect an end to the covert U.S. aid now being given to Iraq-based Kurdish separatists in Iran, the PJAC, and I'm sure they would raise other covert operations uh, in Baluchistan uh, in particular. Uh, now I'll comment, uh, and, and, and those of you who may not uh, want to accept it, what I'm saying about the, the Kurdish <coughs> operation might read a very fine piece in the LA Times several weeks ago in which uh, he uh, had a, the uh, LA Times correspondent had some very good interviews that uh, make this absolutely, make previous evidence, uh, nail down and reinforce previous evidence on this. Now, I, I don't want to overstay my, no, it's okay. my time, but I wanted to comment briefly on Afghanistan, the Gulf, and the nuclear issue, <clears throat> just to give you an idea of what I, uh, what I uh, have, have found. One of my best on-the-record conversations on Afghanistan was with Aladin Burujerdi, the chairman of the Majlis Foreign Affairs and Security Committee. Like everyone you talked to in Tehran, he recited at length the many ways in which Iran had helped the U.S. to defeat the Taliban and to set up the Hamid Karzai government, including battlefield military intelligence through advisors attached to the Northern Alliance and, of course, political help at the Bonn Conference. Quote, our reward was membership in the axis of evil. Now, I'm sure you've all heard this from many, many uh, uh, Iranians. This is a, the, the, the feeling of unreciprocated overtures is very strong, and one could develop a whole dialogue on this. Iran has spent $625 million on economic aid to Kabul since 2002, is planning to spend much more, is ready to work closely with the U.S. to combat narcotics production and trafficking. Burujerdi emphasized narcotics. He called this, quote, an area in which serious cooperation could make all the difference in dealing with this problem. 
unquote. Uh, he said that if a peacekeeping force of Islamic countries is proposed to supplement or replace U.S. and NATO forces, quote, we can propose to our supreme leader that Iran participate in such a force. Both Burujardi and the foreign ministry officials uh, I talked to who work on Afghanistan, handle Afghanistan, dismissed allegations of Iranian help to the Taliban as, quote, disinformation from a country or countries that are themselves guilty. We are completely with the U.S. in opposing them. Now, I'm in no position to judge this very important and difficult issue. I do not have definitive information on whether Iranian weapons have or have not gone to the Taliban. If so, how? But I think it's important to recognize that U.S. accusations about this have died down. Iran is actively involved now on the propaganda front in Afghanistan in pushing Shia religious and cultural themes with three TV channels that have a wide audience, especially in Herat. Now regarding the Gulf. I have found, a, to my surprise, because I, I went to Tehran the first time with all kinds of lists of what the elements of a grand bargain might be and, and all kinds of ideas about U.S. disengagement from the Gulf and so forth, and I found a very pragmatic attitude in Tehran. Despite the propaganda, no one really expects the United States to withdraw militarily from the Gulf. Of course, Iran regards the U.S. carriers sent to the Gulf as a very serious provocation, especially since U.S. carriers in most parts of the world carry tactical nuclear weapons, even though our policy, of course, is NCND, neither confirm nor deny anything about nuclear weapons. But having covered East Asia and the Korean Peninsula a great deal, I know that in that part of the world they do. They are equipped with tactical nuclear weapons. I can't say that they are in the Gulf, but the Iranians suspect that they probably are. So if we ever do get into talks about a modus vivendi in the Gulf, I'm sure removal of the carriers would be their first demand. Iran does not expect to have a dominant security role in the Gulf, but neither is it ready to accept U.S. dominance. What I can see as a realistic basis for a modus vivendi, and you'll note that I use the phrase throughout, modus vivendi, not accommodation. Realistic basis for a modus vivendi is a reduction of the U.S. military presence along the lines proposed by Kenneth Pollack of the Saban Center at Brookings in Foreign Affairs. The U.S. Air Force would keep its base in Qatar. The Navy would remain in Bahrain. But in Pollack's words, quote, fewer American warships would ply the waters of the Gulf, unquote. He speaks of an over-the-horizon capability with equipment prepositioned in Kuwait and Qatar and container ships stationed in Diego Garcia. I tried this out on a number of my interlocutors in Tehran and found considerable receptivity. The problem comes in defining a level of expansion of Iran's naval and air capabilities that would result in what Pollack calls, quote, a security condominium on compatible terms. So I don't underestimate the difficulty of uh, working out uh, security modus vivendi in the Gulf, but uh, neither do I think it's, it's impossible. Now, much of what is written in the U.S. depicts Iran as playing a troublemaking role in the Gulf, in which it is arrayed against Saudi Arabia in a sort of mortal struggle. But in reality, the most striking fact about the Gulf in recent years, if we look at this dispassionately, has been the change in the Saudi posture toward Iran since King Abdullah replaced King Fahd, and the responsive Iranian posture, starting with Rafsanjani's Hajj pilgrimage in April 1997, continuing with the two meetings that Khatami uh, had with Abdullah, culminating with the March 2007 Ahmadinejad Abdullah summit. At that summit, you will recall, Abdullah standing next to Ahmadinejad said that, quote, we will never allow any force from outside the region to draw the future of the region. This was dismissed in the U.S. as nothing more than rhetoric, but I found many in Tehran who hope that it marked the beginning of the evolution of a bipolar balance in the Gulf based on an Iran-Saudi accommodation. Of course, military stability would not end political competition in which Iran continues to support its Shiite Arab proxies, 
and the Saudis continue their effort to wean them off their dependence on Tehran. The angry statement by King Fahd yesterday about Lebanon reminds us that Saudi-Iranian political tensions will be serious, but that doesn't mean that the Saudis will join in a military arrangement against Iran, a very important distinction, it seems to me, in the context of many of the things that uh, Vice President Cheney has been saying recently. In conclusion, a word about the nuclear issue. I have discussed this at length in the fall 2006 World Policy Journal, and regrettably, nothing has changed. The U.S. is not serious about a negotiated settlement, or it would not be insisting on the suspension of enrichment as a precondition for negotiations. We conned the Iranians once by getting them to suspend at the outset of negotiations in November 2004, and they all say they will certainly not be conned again. The nuclear negotiations between Iran and the European Union, I, I want to uh, explain that statement because uh, the media have not given you any, anything on which to base agreement with what I've just said. The nuclear negotiations between Iran and the European Union in 2004 and 2005 were based on a bargain that the EU failed to honor. Iran did suspend its enrichment efforts for more than half a year. This was linked to the outcome of discussions on a permanent enrichment ban. The EU promised to put forward proposals for security guarantees as well as economic incentives in return for a permanent ban, but subsequently refused to discuss security issues. The language of the joint declaration that launched the negotiations on November 14, 2004 was unambiguous and it should be clearly understood by anyone thinking about the nuclear issue. Quote, a mutually acceptable agreement, it said, would not only provide objective guarantees that Iran's nuclear program is exclusively for peaceful purposes, but would, quote, equally provide firm commitments on security issues, unquote. Now, that's what former Ambassador Zarif and many of those in Tehran who put their reputations and positions on the line in pursuing these negotiations knew they had to get out of them in order to make this fly in Tehran. Working groups on political and security issues were to report back in three months, but the U.S. proved to be unwilling to cooperate with the EU in formulating concessions to Tehran relating to its security concerns. So the fact is that they were conned, and they did suspend enrichment uh, under a commitment that was not honored, and all factions in Iran agree that they should not be conned again. And when you get beyond that, in trying to characterize the internal dialogue within Iran on the nuclear issue, you get into territory that I don't feel competent to, to pronounce on. Um, I think that uh, there are differences outstanding now uh, that are very uh, serious within, within the Iranian leadership on the terms of any resolution of the nuclear issue and what the objectives of the nuclear program are. So would a nuclear, a nuclear settlement be possible if we agreed to negotiate without preconditions? Given a settlement in Iraq, which I think is key to everything else, I think it would be possible to get a freeze at some point in such negotiations on weapons-grade enrichment, a freeze under IAEA inspections. Now, the, re the reciprocity required is where uh, I, I only have winks, nods, and hints, and I don't feel uh, uh, that we will know until we have such a dialogue. But I think a freeze in return for a freeze is the U.S. would have to certainly make a formal commitment not to use nuclear weapons in the Gulf, perhaps as part of a multilateral nuclear free zone agreement involving other powers. A nuclear free zone agreement in the Gulf when I made this proposal in the Washington Post in October 2007, I emphasized that no one in Tehran with whom I talked about such trade-offs 
talked about a security commitment extending beyond the Gulf into the Middle East. In other words, the U.S. could rule out using nuclear weapons in the Gulf without ruling out their use in the defense of Israel. I emphasize this in closing because it illustrates to me the pragmatic worldview that I believe one finds in Tehran, notwithstanding the many differences within the system on the details of what to do in negotiations and notwithstanding Ahmadinejad's deplorable rhetoric. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we'll now open the floor to a uh, question. Bob, please, just if you could wait for the mic for a minute. And by the way, there, is a, there are copies of this, um, uh, of this uh, what I've just said, available from Abigail Cohen. Where are you, Abigail? Over here. And uh, there are about 20 copies, and it's sort of a first-come, first-served deal. We'll, we'll post it on our website. Oh, you'll post it on the website. Yeah. Good, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Bob, just go ahead, please. Uh, thanks, Sig. As you certainly know, uh, the amount I know about the Middle East wouldn't even... I'm sorry. Do you mind doing that afterward? Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, Bob. Please. You know, the amount I know about the Middle East won't even fill up a thimble. Um, but if you would permit me a very brief factual question and then perhaps uh, a bit more involved question. The factual question is simply, are you in a position to share with us um, who uh, supported this trip, who funded uh, the, both of these trips um, for you? The other question, um, I wonder if we can explore the proposition uh, a bit more that a Shiite dominated Iraq would be susceptible to Iran's political influence. Um, you mentioned another of other factors which might run counter to uh, influence from Iran. Memories of a very bloody war, problems endemic in sharing a common border, national rivalries, the Wolfowitz argument. Um, so I wonder whether you and perhaps others uh, who are expert in the region, what's, the, what's behind the basis for the assumption that co-religionists here would find it easy to collaborate where co-religionists in other areas of the world, historical Europe, for instance, um, simply have not been able to collaborate? Well, I would certainly be interested in hearing the comments of many of you here who have studied uh, the history of this whole situation more than I have. I guess my answer first on the funding would be that um, the Rockefeller family has a number of, uh, of uh, foundations that don't carry the name Rockefeller. One of them is the Trust for Mutual Understanding, and they funded this, this, uh, this, this trip. Uh, they f funded both trips. Uh, Well, I think that, you know, I, I treated Mr. Fyth's uh, view that, uh, that the differences on the uh, government by the jurisprudent uh, slogan of, or, or doctrine of the uh, Iranian regime and the uh, Ayatollah Sistani's position, uh, his uh, treatment of that as, as foreshadowing an unraveling of the regime in Tehran. I, I treated it rather disrespectfully because, to me, in the context of the of the decision to invade uh, invade Iraq, uh, it seems clear to me that the short-term validity of such a hope uh, seems very, very implausible to me. Um, I think that, uh, that that there are big differences between the um, the nature of the historic interaction between the uh, Shiite environment in Persia and the Shiite environment in Mesopotamia, which, from the reading I've done so far, and the talking I've done so far, Richard Fry did a very, one of his books uh, influenced me, uh, it seems to me is different from, uh, it's created, created a situation politically uh, different from some of the cases you're probably thinking of in other parts of the world. 
um, the way in which the religious overlap was related to political control historically, I, I would uh, suspect is the key to this. But after all, all I was talking about was the way it's perceived by Iran today. I don't pretend to be a, 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 the, a, um, a scholar of the uh, history of Iran and Iraq, and therefore I don't think I should go beyond that. I just think that fights, uh, that the premise, that the, that the fact that people were thinking that this was going to fall, Iran was going to fall apart, the regime was going to fall apart because of what we were, of the nature of the Shiite um, uh, power structure in Iraq, I thought this was an important thing in understanding the mindset, the view that Iran and North Korea were going to collapse, were collapsible, was a very important factor. In, in, but whereas Iraq, we, uh, it was assumed, had to be dealt with this way by people who felt that to deal with terrorism, we had to get rid of these regimes. So I don't think I'm the guy to answer that question in any definitive way, but it's a, certainly a very good question. <laughs> Um, yes, please. Could you wait for the mic? Also, Justin, mic, please. Yeah. Thank you, Hala. Edward Joseph, uh, Johns Hopkins Sice. Sir, from your uh, remarks uh, near the end of your very interesting, fascinating presentation, uh, I wasn't clear. Were you suggesting that an understanding with Iran, a U.S. understanding with Iran, is a precondition to a settlement in Iraq, or a settlement in Iraq is a precondition for an understanding with Iran. And secondly, the, that settlement in Iran, you said that uh, Iran fears a breakup of Iraq that would uh, lead to an independent Kurdish state. Then what settlement does it prefer? Does it prefer more the Hakim version of a heavily federalized Shia-type region or the Sadr uh, vision of a, a more centralized still dominated by Shia uh, uh, approach. Thank you. Well, that's a very, very good question, as people say when they are troubled with what to say in reply. I, I think that uh, the um, – I, I don't think that there is at this point a clearly formulated Iranian view in what is an ongoing debate within Iran that I, I sense about uh, what they want is a stable Iraq. Uh, a f what they define as a friendly Iraq that will not be a threat to them. And what I was saying basically, what I'm saying basically is, proceeding from the, the, the fact that the United States is, is trying to consider what to do in Iraq, I, don't, I believe that there, there can be no graceful orderly withdrawal from Iraq and the reconstruction of a stable post-occupation Iraq without the cooperation of Iran. That's what I'm trying to say. Well, I, I, that's what I say. I don't think. I don't think. It, I think what they want. Uh, they, they, uh, their uh, their uh, effort is to keep a hand in with all actors, so that what they end up with are friends in power in 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 Iraq. And I don't think they're overreaching and trying to manipulate to the uh, micromanage. And of course, uh, the question of how much. Uh, Clout uh, Hakim has in Tehran as against how much clout uh, Moqtada has, and, and uh, this type of thing is not something that any outside observer uh, can honestly pretend to, to um, have an answer for. All I know is that, that uh, they are very angry about what they see now as a U.S. shift in policy I didn't go into all this, but you know, in 2005, we went along rather belatedly with elections that produced a government they were very happy with, a, a dispensation they were very happy with. In their perception, we changed our policy when we started the Sunni awakening. And that's what they're, they're upset about. They see the Sunni awakening as, a, as a, an abandonment of the acceptance of, the, of, of a Shiite-dominated Iraq that they thought we had accepted in when we really let the elections in 2005 go their way without real CIA intervention, according to David Ignatius, which is an interesting historical point. And we did, you know, first we 
we, the history of all this, our attitude toward the question of uh, Iran's involvement in the Shia, Shiite empowerment is, is history still being written. But um, it seems from what I've been able to, to gather so far, uh, those of you who are really rock watchers may know more about this. The U.S. didn't like uh, Hakim at first at all. Mr. Bremer didn't like him at all, and, and uh, he hated Muqtad al-Sadr, but he didn't like Hakim, and we just kind of drifted into accepting the 2005 elections when, Mr. when Ayatollah Sistani insisted on it, and the UN, Mr. Brahimi, helped us along. And then, uh, according to David Ignatius, the <laughs> this is a very fascinating chapter, that the CIA had a plan for getting into those elections in a big way, which... Um, uh, didn't go through for a number of reasons having to do with congressional objections and other things. I, I haven't been able to confirm this story, but he wrote a whole column about this, and his, I don't think he's usually careless about this sort of thing. And, and uh, so, um, so Iran had a sort of unhindered ability to help Hakim and, Bo and, and others, help all of the groups in the 2005 elections, and uh, they feel that they thought at that point that things were moving along fairly well, I gather. But then this Kuni awakening changed everything in their perception. And Barbara? Hi, Barbara Slavin from USIP. Just a, n not so much a question, well, a, a comment and a question, I guess. Um, in my conversations with the Iranians about uh, Iraqi politics, there seems to be a clear preference for Iski and Hakim. Um, and the involvement with Sadr is because they're afraid that Hakim may not remain on top, that after all, uh, Abdelaziz Halakim is, is ill, they're concerned about whether his son will be able to keep control of the movement, uh, but that they do not really like Sadr very much, they don't trust him very much, uh, and apparently it's mutual, he has turned to them because he has no alternative. Uh, but their preference would be for Iski Dawa to remain in control of Iraq. Um, and I also sense that they would like the idea of a Shia stand, although they have not formally said so, uh, that they do like the idea of, of, of a very powerful uh, Shia province in, in the south. And I just wondered if you might talk a little bit more, if you ask them more about Muqtada, about his whereabouts. Is he really studying to be an Ayatollah in Qum? Uh, when I was in Qum in March, nobody there said they'd seen him. So I just wonder if you got any insights about that. Thanks. Well, what you said about Shiistan is very important, I think. I haven't been able to get anybody to really talk about that. And I think that that's a very important question, which I have a great stack of files of uh, trying to understand that whole issue, because I think that is really uh, probably the sexiest issue in terms of the whole future of the situation. Uh, but. Uh, I, I certainly, uh, I don't disagree with what you said at all. I think it's very helpful that you've, uh, you've said this. Sure, they, they, they prefer Hakim as long as he seems to be the one who's on top and, and uh, represents a more conservative uh, approach toward the future of, of Iraq. Uh, Muqtada al-Sadr does emphasize Arab identity much more than uh, uh, does emphasize Arab identity, and, in, and, in, and I, I have found indications that he's really more acceptable to some of the outside powers, precisely because they can see him as, as uh, less likely to be under the thumb of any uh, of, of, of Tehran. But that doesn't alter the fact that uh, Iran, uh, that everything I heard anybody say about al Sadr was of somebody who's being victimized now by the United States, uh, that the, um, what's happening in, in, in Sadr City and the whole... Uh, so they, the basic bottom line is Iran has been systematically attempting to keep on good terms with all Shia factions, it seems to me. But I don't disagree that they've been trying to work with al-Maliki and, and, uh, and, uh, and Hakim at the present time. It seems to me the Iranians have distinguished, they have supported the Maliki government in terms of getting control over Basra and the oil, where they have split and where Comey in that, those comments you mentioned, the ambassador, uh, Iranian ambassador split, was 
in terms of the attack on Sadr City. And of course that makes eminent sense because if the U.S. manages to squelch the Sadrus movie in, uh, uh, movement in Sadr City, then they don't have the ability to fire rockets into the green zone and to directly threaten the U.S. presence. Right. So I think it's important to note that they have made a distinction and that they've supported the, the Baghdad government in terms of locking down Basra, but not Sadr City. But if, is it your perception that they are supporting, <laughs> that they have object, any particular objectives in the provincial council elections and, and uh, in the uh, overall struggle for power between the two? It seems to me that what you say about Basra is quite, quite correct. So they're, they're steering a very uh, careful line. As you say, they do prefer this... Uh, What's, what's the word for, to describe Hakim? I mean, it's, he's the preeminent, it's the preeminent uh, force in the Shiite community in Iraq. Uh, I'd like to know more about, but, but at the same time, they, they are very, uh, being very careful to keep, uh, their, to keep all of their Revolutionary Guard relationships and other relationships with Sadr intact, and he needs them and they need him. So... I think the basic point is Iran is trying to keep hedge its bets in Iraq and is helping all Shiite elements, and and so they they want to be in a position to um, to count regardless of how things turn. Um, yes, yes, please. Um, just if you could. Uh, I'm Bill Eicher, uh, Mr. Harrison. Uh, when Ryan Crocker and uh, David, David Petraeus were before the Congress. Uh, they uh, they told uh, that uh, the Iranians uh, did not wish uh, to talk uh, in Baghdad uh, uh, on uh, a couple of occasions, and that they were still trying. Um, my question basically is. Uh, do, is Iran in such a position, and are they so successful in their foreign policy uh, that they simply uh, don't want to make any concessions, uh, don't want to talk uh, peace? Uh, and uh, finally, uh, is peace at great risk now in the Persian Gulf with Iran uh, and uh, Iraq and the U.S.? They, there were, there have been three rounds of Baghdad negotiations. There have been three. So uh, they were, uh, Petraeus and Crocker were, were referring to the skirmishing over the, as yet uh, to be held next round, which Iran has just suspended the negotiations because of the Sadr City situation. Uh, and, and so I think that, um, you know, Iran has, has uh, I think the initiative for these talks, I don't think you can say that the initiative for the negotiations uh, in Baghdad has been American. It's certainly been uh, a probing operation in which Iran has been ready for this. But they're ready for it when they think they have a promising environment, something to, to negotiate about. Now, as for the overall situation in the Gulf, I tried to suggest that, uh, simply suggest uh, what I've been able to, to get, which is a, a pragmatic attitude, uh, Iran doesn't want a collision with us in the Gulf, but they do have political objectives that they are pursuing, just like we're pursuing political objectives throughout that region. We have clients whom we help, and they have clients whom they help. And uh, the, you know, the <laughs> When you look at a tragic situation like the one in, in, in Lebanon, you really, um, uh, it's, it's difficult not to ask the question you're, you're asking. But as I've said, I think we have to draw a distinction between this uh, political competition with, uh, 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 supported with, with uh, military assistance and a broader uh, environment of potential military conflict in the Gulf. We are going two last questions together. Uh, short questions, please. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Chao Chen, Mellon. Uh, thank you for giving this talk. Could EU and U.S. reach a common ground in dealing with Iran on uh, nuclear issue? And then, how could Iran trust the EU and U.S.? Okay. And let's take another question, too. 
Yeah. Uh, Michael Adler from the Wilson Center. Just one qu quick question on something that's not been covered. Did you discuss the, the effect of any kind of military clash between Iran and the U.S. and how the Iranians would react? Specifically, could there be, would any spark lead to a general conflagration or could things be kept under control? Well, that last question is uh, beyond my uh, pay grade, as people say. I, um, mm -hmm. No, I mean, I, all I can convey to you is um, that although I'm not uh, familiar with all of what all of the uh, actors in, this, in the debate in Iran are saying uh, and exactly how the internal argument plays out, I do – I, I have come away from these two visits with a, with a feeling that Iran is ready for a modus vivendi with the United States. I don't use the word accommodation because that implies giving up the political objectives in this, with respect to Hezbollah in particular that uh, Hamas that, that bring us into another arena, the arena of U.S. policy toward Israel. But I do think that, that a modus vivendi that would avoid the war that you just talked about, is possible, is desired by all elements in Iran, though within Iran there are arguments over the terms, within Iran, over the terms that would, Iran would have to get for such a modus vivendi. But I, I think the main point I'm trying to make today, and what I came away from my last visit with, is that Iraq is more basic to the whole future of our relationship with Iran than is generally reflected in American discussion. American discussion of Iran is these, these damn Iranians sending in these weapons and interfering in Iraq. A very American-centered uh, way of looking at things, understandable when we're losing lives in Iraq. But what I'm trying to say is that if the United States wants to get out in an orderly fashion from Iraq, it cannot do so without cooperation with Iran, that Iran is ready for such cooperation that uh, it's important to get the, into that fourth round of negotiations in Baghdad between the U.S. and Iran that is now suspended. And uh, it's important to stop the slaughter in Sadr City, which places the Iranians in a very awkward position, precisely because they want to keep their links with Muqtada al-Sadr intact. And they can't do it. If, uh, and, and they can't tell him, you can't have this weapon to retaliate if we're going in there with Apache helicopters, going after their any place we think might have a missile and bombing and strafing houses. So, you know, it seems to me that um, I'm not a military expert, but I do think it's obvious that we've embarked on a new military strategy towards Sadr City in the last month or so. And this, the significance of this has been recognized by some good correspondents like Alyssa Rubin in the New York Times and uh, the McClatchy correspondent. What? Oh, uh, oh, LA Times. I thought she was McClatchy. Well, she was on, she was on, she was on uh, Bill Moyers. And uh, there are some good correspondents who have been pointing out what's, what's going on, what the real change that's taken place in our policy and the dangers of it politically and the Iranian dimension of it. But on the whole, I'm really, as a former media person, very sad at the performance of my, my, many of my colleagues. And I wouldn't want to be in their shoes anyway in Baghdad, so it's hard for me to say that. Uh, the, but the, the, the first question. Oh, I'm sorry. The EU. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. The yeah. EU, I think that's a very good question. I think that, um, I think that the, if, I, I think that the U.S. leadership on the terms for resuming negotiations would decide what is done. I think there are different views within the EU on, on this. Um, there certainly is more flexibility within the EU on uh, formulas for enrichment that would guard against weapons-grade enrichment than there is in the U.S. Uh, among the U.S. Uh, negotiators on this issue. So I think if the U.S. made a basic decision, we are not going to make enrichment a suspension, a precondition for negotiations, um, and would get into negotiations on the basis that the, uh, was agreed upon in 2000. I'd really like to see a rerun of what was done in um, 2004 to 2005, 
You could almost take the same statement that was agreed upon in November 2004. I think the EU would agree upon it again, but this time the U.S. would have to, have to be willing to talk seriously about security guarantees to Iran relating to cross-border attacks from Iraq by any U.S. bases remaining there and ruling out the use of U.S. nuclear weapons in the Gulf. I think if we were willing to talk about things like that, uh, Iran would not uh, expect us to disengage from our, many of our bases in Afghanistan and in Iraq that are dear to the hearts of the Pentagon. But I think some basic security commitments, guarantees, would have to be written into negotiations on, on the nuclear issue. And, and I think that um, the key is just getting over this idea that you can get them to negotiate uh, with uh, having suspicion.